society as their job or in their personal life. Moreover, education can act through a well-balanced curriculum, uh, which is also modern, and that builds a sense of belonging and promotes democratic, democratic active citizenship. That is why we should regard education as an investment and not a public expense. And I would like to perhaps highlight what the Rector of College uh, Bruce said. The power of education is perhaps to empower each future citizen. We all know this information and fake news are also affecting the way in which we perceive and relate to changes and debates in society. Media literacy understood as a skill to navigate large amounts of information from multiple sources and communicate it on different platforms has become a requirement, I would say, for the health of our society. But digital skills alone are not enough to empower citizens who are taking their news from online outlets. <laughs> Critical thinking and advanced literacy skills are increasingly needed to help all active citizens to look for the source and filter any information to their own reasoning and value system. And we all know that COVID-19 crisis has sped up digitalization of teaching and learning and highlighted the complex role not just of teachers but of schools and universities alike. We now perhaps treasure more the social role of education and we understand better that um, human beings don't just learn by acquiring information, they learn by interacting in a healthy way with each other. As shown by the PISA test, we see that socioeconomic background has a deep impact on school performance. Too many young people drop out of school before gaining the skills they need to get into the labor market, and unfortunately, the pandemic is not helping in this regard. At the beginning of this month, um, as we know here in Romania, two new education laws came into force. Of course, the, the, this new legislative framework is based on equity, equality, and inclusion, alongside principles very dear to higher education, such as academic freedom, university autonomy, and freedom of thought and expression. Because otherwise, we lose the essential of what the university is. The education governance structures and communities will also benefit from the reforms and investment in the National Recovery and Resilience Plan. And our plan is to deliver a reform which brings our education system and thus our society closer to the green and digital transformations. Some of these reforms are already undergoing, I would like just to mention a few of them. First of all, reducing early school leaving and increasing autonomy of schools to identify and implement specific measures. Each school is unique, each school has a grant with which they, they tailor um, the measures needed to make sure no child loses its potential or the opportunity to have equal access to education. Secondly, we have developed an inclusive um, and positive early education system and care um, in order to make sure that the socioeconomic background of children does not impact on their ability to go to the, the mandatory education years. Thirdly, we have established a full dual route, um, dual professional education route that provides access all the way to higher education, but with a graduate profile that guarantees democratic competences. Being good at your job does not mean that you cannot and should not be um, an active citizen in a democratic society. At the same time, our attitudes towards values and democracy are shaped every day through interactions with the entire community. And in order to ensure more mindful approaches in our daily interactions, we introduced in 2023 the Green Week, a school educational program that foresees educational activities which raise attitudes, knowledge, and skills linked to the prevention of climate change and the protection of the environment. We're um, trying to also bring forward inter- and transdisciplinary approaches and bring kids closer to the environment, to our woods, um, to our national parks, national parks, to understand better um, the legacy that our 
dear participants, before joining the end of my intervention, I would just like to reiterate that I do not see how any prosperous state can continue to be prosperous and democratic without active citizens which are well trained and flexible for the changes and challenges of the future. Education is one of the fundamental components of any modern and democratic society, as we all know. And I think the times we live force us to act now. A democratic Europe can only exist with an educated Romania. We need to be clear and firm in our goals to deliver strong and modern education systems, which don't just fulfill the needs of today, but also shape the world of tomorrow. I want to thank the National University of Political Science and Public Administration, my university, I'm very proud to say, for being the partner of the Ministry of Education in Oregon in this forum for the first time um, in the um, in line with the other events of the TRISIS um, initiative. I think it's a, it's a very good start, which should continue in uh, the next years. Thank you. Dear Minister, Thank you very much for uh, uh, supporting us in organizing this. As Rector of National University of Political Studies and Public Administration, I have to underline that NSFA, this is the acronym of my university, NSFA, participated five years ago uh, in the organization of uh, the forum. Here in Bucharest, we were co organizers. Uh, and uh, we are very proud this time we succeeded to add this component related to uh, democracy. In fact, initially we started to think at university cooperation, but we realized if we see a mistake, we focus just on this, we have to understand the bigger role that education, research uh, can play in development of society, and first of all, in trying to uh, strengthen the democratic values of our society. This morning, very early, I uh, read the joint declaration of our head of state and uh, government, and I tried, as a professor of communication, to identify the keywords of this declaration and somehow compare with the same declaration uh, eight years ago. And uh, probably you well remember this uh, idea started with uh, increasing the economic cooperation to coordinate the efforts of the 12 states in building infrastructure and a lot of economic infrastructure, connectivity, energy stocks, which I'm not uh, at all against, but uh, as the minister said, how, uh, how, how, how can we have a strong society and a strong economy without a strong education uh, and uh, democratic values? And finally, we came up with the idea discussing with our colleagues from the government who are in charge with the organization of the forum and discussing with the um, Romanian Minister of Education to organize this side event on democratic challenges, and uh, I hope this topic will be integrated in uh, the future um, crisis uh, initiative activities. I will quote from the yesterday declaration, the point 18, number 18 from the declaration says, we reaffirm our commitment to work together for connectivity in science, education, technology, and innovation to provide more sustainable future development for the species initiative region. And uh, so we had in mind this idea, it's not us writing down this paragraph, but we were in the same uh, line and uh, we tried to put together for today this uh, session, inviting people from academia, but also from uh, the governments and international relations. And, uh, we have uh, this session in, in, uh, shared into, let's say, slots. The first one, <coughs> moderated by our colleague Victor Negrescu, which somehow already started due to the um, time um, of constraint. And the second one is moderated by uh, Ivana Rosana Kalenchuk. 
Minister of European Affairs in the very complicated year 2019, when Romania had to manage the presidency of the European um, um, Council, uh, vice director of our university, and I'm very happy he accepted to uh, take this position for a um, uh, period of time, and today back in the parliament and vice president of the commission on um, uh, education. Victor, thank you for uh, participating and professor of our university last term. Thank you for uh, accepting to play this role today. You have the floor. Thank you, director. Thank you, minister, for your very constructive and of positive intervention. I think it laid the ground for our debate in this panel. Will we have uh, three prominent uh, guests? Uh, before introducing them, I would close just uh, on the line briefly the fact that, of course, uh, without uh, democracy, we cannot have a uh, strong economy. I know there is strong emphasis in this uh, uh, format to speak about uh, economic cooperation, about connectivity, but also we need a strong education system and exchanging on this respective issue is, is key right now. And of course, in order to face the challenges that we have in front of us, but also the regional challenges, it is key to discuss about that and how we can do that. And today we have three guests in this panel. I will uh, just introduce them and, and say a couple of words about them before giving each of them the floor. Uh, I would uh, like to have initially a short intervention uh, uh, underlining the, the main issue of our panel which is a global perspective uh, regarding for those two kind of challenges that we are currently facing. And after that, I will, will come back to that with a short question. But of course, we have limited time, so we will kindly ask each of the speakers to also try to, to have uh, as, uh, as precise as possible interventions uh, during the panel. So we have Ambassador Sonic Dugano, who is here on my right. He is the director of the European Union Satellite Center. Since 2019, he has a long experience, of course, with the institution, but also a long diplomatic experience and a long academic experience as well. And we are happy to have him with us today. We also have Andrei Sadinsky. Uh, he is the head of the Central European Department at the Center for Eastern Studies in, in Poland. Marshall has a long experience in Central uh, Eastern Europe, uh, working on different initiatives, also horizon projects. This is also something that needs to be on the line we need to emphasize the need to bring our energies together also in, in the European competition. Why not? And, and bring our added value uh, in the European framework. And last but not least, we also have uh, Florent uh, Marciac. He's a Deputy Secretary General of the Oscar French Center for Rapprochement in Europe, uh, in Austria. Uh, he uh, worked as a, as a researcher. He understands very well the region. He has a strong focus on European integration in the Western Balkans and Eastern neighborhood. You have noticed also at the summit level that this has been one of the key handles of the debate between our leaders. So, uh, after presenting uh, our guests for this panel, I will come back to each of them and briefly ask them, and I'll start with uh, Ambassador Lucaro, to, 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 to say a few words about this global perspective that uh, needs to be taken into consideration uh, by the members of the three series initiative. And also, on the line to a certain extent, how in your work you are basically interacting uh, with this uh, initiative, but also with the member states, and how we can also be more present, especially at the level of the European Union Satellite Center, where we are doing a great job. Yeah, that's very good. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. And <coughs> let me uh, start by Thanking the organizers and the Ministry of Education for putting this um, uh, on the agenda in the framework of the three C's initiative, because frankly, uh, we, we cannot uh, really promote the objectives of uh, prosperity and actually security, which is very much on anyone's mind, without putting democracy on the forefront. So, I will address democracy from a security dimension and also include uh, some uh, technology favor uh, in this, because it has to do also with what I'm doing. Advice of the moderator. Uh, now, it's well known that democracy can never be taken for granted. Uh, we saw this in history. Uh, it can arose also from the inside, from populism, with lack of central institutions, corruption, outstanding economic factors or social political 
polarization, complacency, and, and so on. But when outside factors are added, when it is frankly under attack from outside uh, forces, sometimes with the insider access or even with the insider collusion, then the picture is much more complex. And uh, I think the, 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 the first weakness is to think democracy definitely in strategic uh, and security uh, terms. And I think we are, as we speak, uh, in such a uh, situation. Because um, there is a warm confrontation, there is a war going on in our uh, neighborhood with all the brutality and characteristics of a classical war, but also with the subtleties of, uh, I would say, the, the, the hybrid uh, warfare strategy and, and, and tactics. And at the heart of this strategy, is to, to use one sense of one word, is frankly the weaponization of everything. Uh, definitely of information, of narratives, of uh, value distortion, hijacking of values, uh, turning them upside uh, uh, down, uh, making um, frankly anti values value distortions uh, yeah. to, to uh, uh, using uh, some types of values to, 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 to uh, put them against the, uh, uh, against others. And let's recall that uh, anti-Semitism or, or racism were promoted in the name of patriotism during uh, Nazi uh, times. And frankly, uh, we can see some uh, tendencies uh, today and the Ukrainian in the name of patriotism. We see it all over when you to watch the news and so on. Uh, and interesting that mostly in news, as I said, from, from the outside of the So beyond this, this strategic approach, the hyper-strategic approach, there, there is um, the aspect of the um, amplifying effect of modern technologies. So there are some uh, very uh, potent tools Deployed today, uh, empowered by modern technologies, under the cover of modernity, efficiency, sometimes democratic values, democratic access to information, freedom of expression. Uh, but if we don't look to, to them uh, from all the angles, uh, I'm afraid that uh, we uh, we might uh, become uh, captive. Uh, and uh, there have been already uh, many examples of social media platforms, uh, deep fake, uh, and very fast growing modern artificial intelligence tools can uh, become potent uh, uh, weapons uh, in this, against democracy in this uh, context. So I think it's essential that the Sweet Seas Initiative considers these aspects uh, in addressing them. Uh, for convergent to understanding, uh, setting convergent mindset, but why not also convergent uh, policy, strategy, and actions? Why? I think there are some good ingredients. Yes, there is this, uh, the, the uh, geographic, uh, geopolitical uh, dimension that has generated, that was at the heart of it. We see the initiative and frankly with the historic. Say, see the, the intermodal uh, process, uh, but also because uh, the, the countries are pretty much on a similar type of attack. And frankly, there is another element that the more recent historic experience uh, and memory of the non democratic uh, times. So, in order to address the defense of democracies, and I will, uh, I will uh, plan to end on this uh, note uh, at a strategic uh, level, um, I think. Uh, um, First, uh, there has to be an approach in considering linking democracy with a security uh, concern, uh, generating a mindset in strategies, policies, legislation, regulation, or project implementation. And I see three key dimensions that I would mainly focus on because this creates the resilience of society. And I will not have to repeat it because it's more detailed because that we presented by the minister before. But there's another dimension where people get sometimes uh, scared and it can be even controversial, but that 
study that of regulation. Now, um, regulation should be seen from the perspective of responsibility and accountability on this wide information uh, highway, not as something against freedom of expression uh, or, or um, all the other democratic um, uh, values. Uh, and, and I think we have so many examples where uh, the use or the, 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 uh, the, the action in the field of uh, information has been associated with accountability. Uh, uh, so in, in the normal, uh, the time where responsibility of, of, of press uh, entities uh, has been uh, defined uh, or uh, on, on other um, so this, this is an important uh, fine-tuning uh, element that has to be uh, addressed so, uh, so that we are better protected. And there's a third dimension, uh, which is that of uh, operationalization or, or action. Um, and uh, I think that there are a lot of um, aspects uh, that can be um, considered here, um, starting with the relevant uh, exchanges of information or analysis among the three seas, countries, coordination of policies um, or implementation of projects, uh, developing uh, trusted fact-checking uh, platform or entities and, and many other aspects. I will not uh, uh, prolong this uh, too much, but I think uh, this uh, element of uh, considering uh, a coordinated approach at strategic level on three three layers, education, regulation, and action uh, would be my main proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I think it's very important that you on the issue of convergence and putting education at the top, but also one other line that, of course, here in this room, we also have a representative of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, and also Secretary of State in charge of education in the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. And this is good. So, based on this idea of convergence, I will move to Mr. Stadensky. Uh, so we speak about convergence, we speak about the region, sometimes we speak about disparity, the gap between East and West. How would you uh, uh, approach uh, these issues uh, in the context of, of, of the challenges that we are facing and how should our region uh, react or uh, act when it comes to, to bring in further convergence uh, at regional level but also with the more developed countries in the West? First of all, uh, I'd like to thank you for organizing it and inviting me. It's a, it's a big pleasure to be here. I think it's, it's definitely the biggest uh, building I ever spoke at, so <laughs> <laughs> a little bit intimidated. Um, I would like to focus in this brief uh, intervention on the, um, on the biggest event that happened in the, in the last years. In, in the region of the state, the, the Russian invasion. In Ukraine, uh, on Ukraine and the consequences for, uh, for the region, uh, obviously if we, if, uh, we discuss the, the issues of the values, uh, this I think proves to be um, a sign that our basic values of freedom and democracy and security cannot taken for granted and uh, and I think this this assumption in the in the region which is of course uh, in the neighborhood of the conflict led to an unprecedented mobilization of uh, countries which uh, I think we don't always uh, acknowledge uh, the region has been uh, uh, at the forefront of this force to explain and it's both, of course, on the, on the, on the state level. Mm, political help, military help, uh, we don't always, we 
situation of this region between these countries within the EU uh, and uh, and uh, and the world also show that this is not only about uh, issues here to create new impulses for the region, but it's also the um, um, the idea to also integrate the region to be able to help Ukraine, uh, to integrate the region to be able to uh, deliver more, deliver etc. 
place but not issue play in that fashion process. Uh, and this is not very clear to me. Uh, but it's not very clear to me not only for largeness because this is the more visible part. Uh, it's not even clear to me uh, for the internal part of the European integration process what kind of play democracy should play. We have a lot of sensitivity and so on and security, but that's the history of, of, of European integration. Uh, but European democracy remains a very, very fuzzy concept. So now if we, if we live in geopolitical times, um, it can be useful to look back on how French societies, ourselves, Western countries, if you will, um, uh, we previously uh, approached this nexus, this tension between, between democracy, security, and geopolitics. Um, that's, that's the debate we have now already happened in the 60s. Um, so Walter, Walter Lippmann, who coined one of the first who coined the term of Cold War, an author, an American author, a journalist, um, he developed a, a, a thought that democracy um, should be judged based on so its effectiveness, outputs, security, uh, prosperity. Nowadays we would put connectivity, project, pragmatism. So you need to achieve that, deliver that, and that's the way you consolidate democracy. That was his thoughts. In geopolitical times, this is how it should be done. To do that, he published a book uh, and uh, the, the, the term today, you have to, to build a manufacture of consent. So basically, you have experts trying to merge acceptability among the masses, mobilize passive support, what nowadays we would call uh, structured communication. So that's, that's the bulk of the idea of the 60s. Um, of Walter Lippmann. Now, what is interesting is, um, the debate is even, even older than the 60s, uh, is Walter Lippmann had, um, had someone not very much agreeing with this argument called uh, John Dewey, a philosopher, uh, so very much into, into pedagogy. Um, and uh, this Dewey, this John Dewey, who, who left quite a big mark, uh, said if, if you give up the power to experts and to nurturing, acceptability, the response in the public will be populism, will be a rejection of experts, a rejection of, of such a communication. We will fuel the, so the, 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 the fire of rejection as well as polarization by focusing on a democracy as output instead of input, where the legitimacy uh, is the, the, the key challenge. So now, when, when we think back about that, um, I'm trying, that's why I'm, I'm thinking now what, 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 what are we as Europeans doing and how would we try to promote democracy, if ever. Um, we certainly promote democracy as Europeans by supporting the efforts of national member states, but that's not European democracy, that's a very different thing. Uh, in terms of European democracy, we are still very much focused on outputs. We have very constitutionalized um, bulk. Uh, so of, of, of law, um, on economy, on monetary policy. We have a lot of projects now, very high on agenda on connectivity, and they are all good, don't, 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 don't get me wrong. Um, but we have this, this history which is extremely anchored um, in, in, European, um, in European sphere. What we don't have um, is, is a definition of European democracy. We don't have a charter so the European Charter, uh, the European uh, Democratic Charter, so the Charter. We have rule of law, uh, we have fundamental rights, but the Weimar Republic and other instances show that it's not because you have the truth that you have democracy. You can see the trees without, without seeing the forest. This is the thing in the Western Balkans and in other countries. If you keep looking at rule of law only and fundamental rights only and attacking them or trying to defend them through market-based anti-discriminatory mechanisms, you miss the forest of democracy. What we don't have is a definition of European democracy going in this sense. Uh, a, reason, so a reason for that, and, and, and beyond, beyond the fact that um, we don't agree with the member states uh, on the definition of what it should include, um, is that we don't have a public, so a public sphere. And this is, I think, where it starts. A public sphere, um, and that goes back to, to my friend John Dewey, the, the, the pedagog pedagogician. Um, uh, to build a public sphere, you need to build European citizens. You don't, you don't become European citizens because you've joined the EU. 
because you're 80. It's not how it works. You don't become citizens just because you pass that test of some, 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 some age or you get your passport. To build a different citizenry, uh, you need to grow a generation of citizens. So that's, that's where I come to some, 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 some uh, recommendations. Uh, what we would need probably to see more often is to draw lessons of what has worked. So I'm thinking about Erasmus, and this is a question a lot of, 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 of education. But we focus too much on, on, on university education when identity is already formed. What we should look at is secondary education. Mobility at the secondary level, not as a one-off thing, but as a normal thing, included in the, in the curriculum where uh, students, whether in the EU or in accession countries, can exchange. So then we can put it, if you, if you want to use the, the, the contemporary words, school connectivity. Uh, but it goes together that if you, if you try to, to, to build the dimension of, of mobility among pupils in secondary sector, secondary education, you will not need to think about what to teach, what to exchange. This is why it goes to European simplification, multilingualism. So these are the basics. If we don't start here, this is a very much an investment. It will last two, 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 two uh, generations to, to bring together this kind of democratic thinking among the younger generation. But I think in the, so in, in the longer term, if we don't have that, we will start talking, we will keep uh, talking about democracy as outputs. We will continue to link democracy to security and geopolitics, and by the way, just fuel the reaction of, 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 of uh, societal polarization. What we need is to build some kind of, of new, new, new generation. Erasmus started at Russia with only 11 countries joining and 3,000 students exchanging. You don't need to be all on board to do that. That can be also an initiative from here. Okay. That's true. I think it's important, of course, to, to define democracy as I really like what you said. You do not become citizens by simply joining the EU. And I think here I'm at, of course, if I also share the values. And one of the values that have been online that I've heard today, the issue of solidarity, and of course, solidarity should be applied in all cases. And of course, here in Romania, but this is another issue as we discussed uh, later on. Uh, we are short on time, but nevertheless, I suggest that we'll ask uh, a question to each of the speakers. I will quickly ask to answer in 30 seconds. I will be as short as possible. So, Ambassador Ducaro, you mentioned many issues, uh, but you also put the, uh, in a contrast, uh, democracy and security. And this is a question that is often being addressed here. How is this, uh, how are we in our uh, region answering to? Challenge here in our region, or do you believe that we will be capable of putting those two uh, challenges together? Uh, thanks for the question. I think look, the, 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 the democracy is pretty much uh, under pressure and sometimes an attack uh, uh, in, in a broader geographic uh, area and pretty much all over Europe, but I think there's a special uh, danger. Proximity to uh, uh, an area of uh, con conflict uh, um, and um, the, all the support that uh, is given, for example, by European nations, especially by neighboring member nations of Ukraine, makes uh, their uh, their societies uh, target to this uh, hybrid tactics that I mentioned. Uh, way ahead, there's one dimension of uh, resilience, so making the, the societies more resilient. So pressures and, uh, and attack, as I mentioned, through uh, education, knowledge, and so on. Um, but I think um, uh, we, uh, there has to be an extra focus on what I would call some, some active defenses uh, against uh, the tactics, which means identifying uh, these tactics, exchanging information about them, uh, acting in common to on and uh, strengthen the resilience uh, uh, against the effects uh, that are posed towards our democracy. Remember, indeed, uh, this is the case. Of course, I will link that to uh, something that Mr. Stavisky mentioned earlier, the issue of reconstruction of Ukraine and support for Republic of Moldova. So what do you believe could be our contribution from this region in the reconstruction? 
great debate now ongoing, I suppose, but uh, well, I suppose we should assess our capabilities. I mean, as I said before, I mean, there are no huge financial assets in the region to invest in Ukraine, as you see, in some, some modern areas, it's doable, but uh, I think where, where we can see a very important role uh, for the region is to be a the sort of anchor of the Ukraine uh, uh, and sort of use the land to, to provide uh, connections to grow, to raise, to also experience we, we have. I mean, uh, Ukraine is in a way a part of the region. I mean, we, we have certain uh, experience, certain uh, understanding also how uh, how approaches. So I think uh, that hopefully will be one of the great projects for Central European uh, countries for the, for the year, years to come, although it's, I mean, a sort of uh, pragmatic uh, assessment also what can we do is important not to uh, inflate too much our
voice in Vienna right now. I'm uh, part of the steering committee, which is a uh, uh, drafting new strategy uh, in Austria, the last one being uh, uh, well, from 2013, and I'm uh, currently consulting the Liberal Party on matters of security and defense. Um, now, let me present my five uh, minutes uh, each for why the TRISIS initiative, as seen from the perspective of uh, geopolitical expert as strategist as I am, uh, is uh, the most ambitious and the most important regional initiative when it comes to geopolitics and geoeconomics of the 21st century and when it comes to the future of Europe. First and foremost, uh, and these are my key theses. Um, it is because Russia is really not only a kinetic war uh, on the second largest uh, European uh, country, but also has been waging a non-kinetic war, that is a war without military means, in fact, on Europe, and of course, from Russian perspective, the most, let's say, um, vulnerable part of the old continent remains the so-called post-Soviet space. This is the soft belly of Europe, how to actually inflict the most pain in economic, but also in geopolitical terms. And in fact, if we take a look at the regional dynamics of uh, this region, uh, if uh, you see how the infrastructure has been built not only during the Cold War, but also the, the last 30 years, namely mostly east-west wars, in, instead of, uh, let's say, uh, north to south, you see uh, clearly the vacuum, not only in terms of security, but also in terms of uh, geoeconomics. So here we have not only Russia, but we have also other key uh, external players that are eager to penetrate, to subverse, to actually get hold, stronghold uh, in the soft valley uh, via different means and tools. And of course, uh, they have uh, let's say, little to no interest in, uh, in seeing strengthened uh, institutions, vibrant democratic societies, and functioning, uh, in fact, democratic processes in these countries, because this would mean uh, automatically that they will have uh, more, let's say, um, more efforts on one hand, they will have to spend more efforts uh, to penetrate the space, but also they will have less instruments to do so. So we have, we know for a fact, three pillars, three important pillars, energy, infrastructure, and digital connectivity, and all of them are actually linked directly to, demo to democracy, to the very idea of democracy, to the very idea of actually how we want to further and, um, let's say, um, um, promote our vision of not only our European liberal economic and security order, but also global one. So, this is my next key thesis, and I know I don't have many good news for you, but I think that we are here for the sake of intellectual exchange rather than uh, to tell ourselves uh, some nice, uh, you know, uh, narratives and pitches. And here it is that uh, the, the war, actually, that Russia launched on uh, Ukraine uh, has been also uh, the trigger uh, for the manifestation of Cold War 2.0. So here, once again, the region and this is a whole region from the north to the south, is at the forefront. It's practically first year region for the new Cold War between the United States on the one hand and Dragonberg, which is not just Russia, but Russia and China as a collective model of a coordination that entails all of the tools and uh, you know, instruments. So third important point, uh, third key thesis, when it comes to this non-kinetic warfare that I'm addressing, and why it is important for this particular region to actually deal with it collectively and not individually uh, in terms of 12 and meanwhile 13 countries, is that it entails not only the energy, and yes, of course, energy has been key point since the beginning, but right now we have actually the same situation with other commodities. Specifically, as we sit here in Romania, we know for a fact that uh, global food price 2.0 is in the making because of Russia's blockade in the Black Sea. So this is a direct threat to our societies. And uh, uh, I can uh, give plenty of examples why this kind of cascading effects, this kind of second order effects will have uh, own societies in our uh, democratic uh, countries. But also think of the nuclear blackmail, which is another perfect example of 
how you have an impact on democratic societies because we are like uh, big uh, boxes of chocolate open to everyone. Everyone can actually grab a uh, chocolate, can eat it, can bring back the, you know, uh, cow for it or do whatever they want with us. Uh, whereas uh, we are dealing with a competitor and with a rival, and I would even argue to the point of an enemy uh, that actually has 100% control of information flow uh, and information space. So it is a, a complete asymmetry in terms of trying to actually cope with the challenges. Uh, the next important point is that even migration, and we've heard everything, uh, we've heard already from the first panel, everything is being weaponized. And once again, we've seen this before the war, and we are going to see further examples where exactly this kind of regional format is going to be first tier uh, playground for the weaponization of migration flows. And I do not know, not only mean those coming from uh, Ukraine and from the other war zones and frozen conflicts in Eastern Europe, we have many of them, but I also mean, of course, North uh, Africa and Iran, where actually Russia also has the tools to instigate migration flows. Uh, final point, of course, uh, yes, we've heard about the information uh, and cyber operations. In fact, Ukraine has been the country that has faced the largest uh, uh, number of cyber operations even before the beginning of the war. So my point is once again that we pretend that we live in peace times and that we actually know what we deal uh, with, but we forget actually that we have 30 years in between and the whole Sovietologist playbook is somewhere, you know, forgotten in some uh, probably floors of uh, our ministries from a previous time and we need, when it comes to education, when it comes to strengthening the resilience of our democratic societies, first and foremost, we need to be open and always with our own societies, with our own population, in terms of the direct and indirect threats, risks, and challenges, we need to start by an open and public debate. And I mean, in Austria, can give you, can give you the perfect example how it backfires when you don't do that. I mean, in terms of the rise of populist, uh, populist uh, political forces, not only on behalf of the far right, but also actually on behalf of the extreme left. So in a sense, uh, what we need to do now is to actually start using the right terminology of what we are having. Because when you, when you finally uh, look at the big picture, and this is unfortunately what we are not able to do because we are just overwhelmed with the daily business of war and the daily business of trying to support Ukraine, which is the right thing to do, but uh, we are missing the bigger picture here. And the bigger picture is that we ourselves have become target of a very sophisticated uh, rival, a very sophisticated competitor who is trying to capitalize on global system shifts and on shift, uh, change in global order and is trying to become, uh, so to say, uh, a wild card in a bigger competition which is not with us. We could be the victim of this, you know, of the missing the missed opportunity to actually address the reality of the way it is. But it is a, a, a competition between two systemic rivals, namely the United States and China. And here, what I think is going to be the biggest uh, challenge, also for our democratic societies and our political elites in this uh, third countries, is uh, that we need to prevent, by all means, any possibility of a kind of bifurcation of Europe because of this uh, upcoming competition. What do I mean by the bifurcation in the sense that um, sooner or later, we all will be confronted, the countries here will be confronted with the very tough choice to pick sides, as it happened during the Cold War. And right now we pretend in Europe that it is about us, that we can actually de-risk our relationship with China, with a bigger, uh, with a bigger let's say, uh, economic, competitor that we do not want to see a security risk. At the very same time, yes, we address the post Russia as the biggest security risk while ignoring the coordination of China. So in a sense, we are stuck in a gray zone where we do not want to see that the new world is struggling to get born and we are still stuck to a world that is timed the way we have benefited from, from it. So, Let's get our collective efforts to 
thermal fluids, all the ideas and all the good uh, solutions, and I have also some for the Q&A, uh, how to actually deal with the situation and to act accordingly and not to wait until all of the systemic processes manifest themselves to the point that we are in an absolute, uh, let's say, uh, worst case uh, scenario situation. Thank you. I would for sure uh, use the fact that uh, I am a director at, uh, at the end uh, of the meeting. I would uh, have at least one question, but maybe also others too. Uh, I would invite the second involving the um, uh, panelists being Marta Halina Gatica from the World Studies University in Warsaw. Uh, thank you for, uh, for coming. Thank you for adjusting to uh, what I asked. Thank you, have to thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation and thank you for uh, being here, the, the possibility. Uh, I was the head of research grant uh, last year, uh, which was financed by Ministry of Defense in Poland. And I will talk about regional perspective as the moderator asked, and uh, challenges and opportunities in the context of results of my research on the Three Seas Initiative. Uh, I was concentrated on economic dimension of uh, security, which means uh, economic security and security of economics. And uh, it will be a very short piece of my research. The bigger part is uh, included in my book. And uh, I just want to mention global mega trends, white cards, and weak signals for Three Seas Initiative and security and economic dimension of security uh, in this context. So uh, I will start with uh, global mega trends, uh, which are phenomena of social, economic, political, and technological changes that provide disruptive phenomena and affect many areas of life. And according to my research, um, there are four mega trends which are the most important for the future of Three Seas Initiative and its countries. And they are um, widening divergence of regional population trends, the global ph phenomenon on, of aging population, increasing social inequalities and disparities around the world, as well increasing inefficiencies in health systems and social security system. So it's very interesting that economic dimension of security is influenced by social trends. And uh, now I want to mention white cards, which are potential future events, which can change dramatically the current processes, either positively or negatively. And they belong to political, economic, and social area. And uh, according to my research, there are some the most important ones. Uh, they are weakening of integration processes in the European Union, social and political attitudes against European Union, limitations, suspension or lack of disbursement of development funds from EU, uh, protracted pandemic and global economic crisis, including energy crisis, deepening of protectionist trends in the economy, in the country's economies. And the next problem mentioned by my previous uh, speakers is negative effects of climate change which has huge results in public expenditure, as well as increasing power of populist and extreme parties in many countries of uh, crisis initiative. And the last 
a huge challenge, which is a white card, uh, is the old one, but it still exists, and it's migration uh, as a result of civil wars in Africa and Middle East, and social conflicts due to increasing poverty. And the last part of my uh, presentation, I would like to concentrate on weak signals, which are triggers of further changes. And uh, they can be good and positive as well, but I see more negative, unfortunately. So, in my opinion, uh, the most important are uneven commitment of crisis initiative countries to the crisis initiative fund, lack of new investors in the fund, limited or delayed disbursement from European Union on the money for development is very important. The next problem is uh, lack of implementation of the US promises to co-finance the fund, uh, as well as unstable situation on global and regional stock exchange, ex uh, exchanges, which influ influence economics. And the next uh, problem is change of presidents and high representatives uh, in the free CIS initiative countries and partner countries. Uh, the next uh, problem is Poland. I know I'm Polish and I see uh, a problem. It's a Polish activity. Uh, many countries uh, perceive Poland as a partner which is too active which wants to dominate other countries. And uh, the other problems are uh, divergent perceptions of strategic partners and uh, enemies uh, among uh, three CIS initiative countries. And the last one problems are uh, extension of the time to lift Maastricht fiscal limits after pandemic, as well as um, the lack of regional and global agreements on climate policy. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Okay, we will go directly to our colleague from Austria. Dana Martinek, Dana from the Institute for the Danish Region and Central Europe. Uh, he's a researcher. That's correct. <laughs> thank you very much. May I start? Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much also for, to the organizers uh, for inviting me for, for this session today and good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'm not only a research associate at the Institute for the Union Region in Central Europe in Vienna, but I'm also very much involved in the permanent secretariat of the Daily Pretos Conference. Maybe you've heard about this, this uh, institution uh, called the DRC, and we are a network of more than uh, 16 universities coming from the region of Central East and Southeastern Europe. So, uh, also from that perspective, I'm very much, uh, I'm very happy that we also touch upon the issues such as education, higher education, research, and so on. And within today's session, uh, which we also perceive as very much important, and within this organization, we very much uh, support, promote, and facilitate uh, international and cross border cooperation. Uh, not, to, not to exceed my time today and stay already into five minutes. Uh, my time today, I would like to focus on the topic of, of this session and its incredible values, challenges, and opportunities, um, which I'm giving as, a, as an idea uh, very much. Um, many issues have been uh, actually mentioned already today, so I'm not going to repeat uh, these statements. Um, I can definitely share uh, the view that uh, there is a need for kind of Europeanness as a, a tool or as a perspective of belonging to a certain group uh, in Europe um, and definitely the need for uh, European public sphere is definitely something uh, we already need to focus on and develop uh, in the future. Unfortunately,
unfortunately, uh, from my perspective, um, very like groups of people or uh, many people are kind of stuck in this um, nation state mindset uh, still, that despite the fact that you have uh, programs such as Erasmus or, or uh, other international corporations, we should actually kind of open eyes of these people and uh, indicate them that. Uh, working in uh, and cooperating in Europe is the only way how to cope with the uh, transformative uh, challenges and you know, geopolitical challenges in general. This is unfortunately not happening, and as uh, it was already mentioned also before, Erasmus Plus is a really nice example of how to promote maybe this arrogance. But at the same time, what we can uh, observe is that, for example, we have uh, MPs or, um, or people working in the EU institutions. Which should represent the peak of European cooperation efforts, and at the same time, when they come back and uh, working in their specific countries, they are at the same time promoting highly nationalistic agenda, blaming the Brussels for all the things happening. And so, so I think we can see quite parallel of situation: people working at the EU institutions, but at the same time uh, promoting uh, high nationalistic agendas uh, back at home. Uh, so, in that sense, um, I would like to argue that it doesn't necessarily mean we are working in Brussels that uh, we would be in favor of uh, like uh, deeper cooperation, deeper uh, integration, or creating some kind of uh, European supranational um, uh, governance structure. Um, then, uh, another challenge that I see here is um, that despite we have these different regional cooperation formats existing in Europe, um, the approach to these very much always depends also on the approach of the relevant governments to these cooperation formats. We can see from the example of the Visegrad group, uh, which is, at least from the geopolitical point of view or European point of view, uh, rather um, not active uh, these, these days. Um, but we can also see, it, uh, for example, in the, in the different extent the countries are dedicated or committed to the cooperation within the uh, 3 cs initiative format. Um, what I would like to also to mention today here is this, as it was already mentioned, that uh, this forum, this summit, or this format is very much fostering infrastructure uh, connectivity and mobility. Uh, what we will definitely also need is this social, social of, uh, connectivity, because what we can observe in the region um, in the past months, years, is, as it was already mentioned, the high polarization of societies, uh, high fragmentation of political landscapes in, a, in a, these various countries, which uh, consequently, at the end of the day, in some cases, didn't uh, or doesn't even allow to form a uh, stable and uh, long term uh, government, which would uh, at least which would last at least for the election cycle of four years. So this is something which we can observe uh, nowadays uh, that the post-election negotiations are difficult due to the reason that the political landscape is very much fragmented in these, uh, in these countries and that uh, contributes a lot to the instability of these, of these countries. Um, we also mentioned different perception of democracy and the rule of law in Europe. That's also something that uh, not only that maybe we try to project our vision of values, democratic values, to the world, but uh, we should very much focus also within, uh, within Europe of what is exactly our uh, perception of what should be the, the framework uh, for democracy, democratic security, uh, particularly in the region of Central East and Central East Europe. But at the same time, I don't want to be too pessimistic or negative. There are definitely opportunities because of what uh, the implications of the full scale Russian invasion in Ukraine for social does uh, was uh, that each and every country, uh, which is part of the Treaties Initiative, but I mean also in general in the, in the region, uh, showed or reject the solution of international conflicts. Of Resolving of international conflicts and then just by the tools of, of war conflict. 
I believe, of course, there are different extent how the countries uh, of our region um, uh, provided support to Ukraine, be it military, be it humanitarian support, and so on. Uh, this is something we can definitely discuss. But uh, at the very core, at the end of the day, all we are all at the same page when it comes to support Ukraine and rejecting the war as a tool to resolve uh, geopolitical conflicts or international tensions. Yeah, I will probably stop here and uh, yeah, these were my two cents to the discussion. Well, thank you, Daniel. Uh, I, have to, I have to say that I'm very curious. You, you mentioned that the mission at the community is not a, uh, an effective cooperation framework. I'm very curious if you find that this is initiative uh, an effective one. But um, I will uh, come back to you at the end. Okay. So um, the following yeah. uh, panelist is Jelena uh, Teka, who is an executive lead in uh, Lovetech, Slovakia. Uh, and from, from what I know, we'll approach the, um, the topic of uh, energy and energy challenges at the level of the city. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed audience. Uh, allow me first of all to start by thanking the organizing organizers for putting in place such an excellent high-level event with so many timely topics in focus. I would especially like to take this also, also this opportunity and to thank the representatives of the National University of Political Studies and Public Administration and His Excellency the Rector of the University, Mr. Remus Prokofiev, for the overall great contribution of the promotion to the promotion of the democratic values and to the genuine change in Romania. As it was uh, uh, mentioned by Ms. Leona Laleka, I represent uh, Globsec, uh, Bratislava, where I lead the Sea Energy Hub. But I'm as well uh, proud to say that I'm uh, a member of the Senesaba family and uh, very thankful for this invitation. My colleagues before uh, presented and highlighted the obvious link between the energy and the democracy, and therefore I would uh, like to briefly present some of the trends that are impacting the development in our region with regards to energy, and to shortly highlight the role of the three seeds initiative in enhancing the re resilience in the region. The multi-layered crisis and the outbreak of the Russian war against Ukraine, of course, profoundly impacted and accelerated the global, but most of all, European energy system. Even before the war, the European Union was already on the path of gradual reduction of carbon footprint. The war became a catalyst for this process. In the meantime, one of the first impacts on the Three Seeds Initiative is that once the decline of competing projects from Russia and China started, the role of the initiative increased. And basically, it became the key player in the region. Now, since the European Union re reduced by 90% of its oil imports and around two-thirds of gas from Russia, the question is what are the challenges and opportunities uh, that, uh, since also Greece joined, the three countries are facing. First one is the definite decoupling from Russian fossil fuels, and it is an irreversible process. We have recently invited Brussels, and I addressed the following question. Let's just say that hypothetically tomorrow the war stops, and uh, Russia will be um, promoting uh, democratic values. What will happen to our energy connections? Are we going to reestablish the old paths of um, energy uh, supplies to Europe. And although there are some uh, skeptical positions and we acknowledge the role of gas in the foreseen future, I could uh, definitely confirm that this is decoupling from Russian fossil fuels is an irreversible process. We are often engaged with numerous private and also governmental stakeholders from the energy sector and we're noticing a really important trend of uh, re-technologization. What I mean is the whole sector, starting from oil and gas, uh, continuing with nuclear, but also renewables, are decoupling in technical uh, terms from the Russian fossil fuels and adapting their spare parts, their capabilities to the new uh, sources and types of energy. 
despite, as I mentioned, the fact that the market will still benefit from uh, conventional gas and LNG deliveries, which are unfortunately even increasing in the last period from Russia, the world triggered, triggered this unprecedented shift. The region is even more impacted due to our proximity, of course, and our specifics when it comes to energy. With the processes that I mentioned, the problem of critical raw materials and spare parts become, becomes more and more important. And here I think that the historical experience in the energy field that our country, and particularly Romania, Slovakia, Czech Republic, but also the Baltic states and Croatia, when it comes to their success with regards to LNG capabilities, along with the region's potential to innovate and the potential to turn the region in a provider of energy sources, transport, technology and spare parts is crucial. The second topic and trend that I wanted to discuss with you today is the fact that, of course, we need diversification of supply, at least for short and medium term. As some countries are more dependent than the others in the region, oil and gas sources, there's still an inherited risk of dependencies of petrostates. The region needs further diversification and interconnection to secure its energy options. But in an interconnected market, we need to be aware of the increasing uh, fossil dependencies on countries moving beyond Russia. Apart from Russia, the region's imports of oil and gas from other suppliers, including petrostates, countries which heavily depend on the land generated by the oil and gas industry. A Russian example made it clear that such an interdependence is working both ways and can be exploited by any party to exert power and increase pressure. All these realities must be even must increase even more our efforts to achieve energy independence and resilience. Our strategies must include engagement with this actor by man maintaining and promoting democratic values and the use priorities. Third, and it is connected to the previous topic, we need to adapt to the ongoing process of redefining the concept of energy security. Already across the transatlantic community in Washington, in Brussels, but as well in international forums, alongside with academia, uh, everybody acknowledged that the old paradigm of secure and affordable energy is clearly obsolete. This paradigm uh, has shifted to issues of security of supply, not only around fossil fuels, but also on critical raw materials, as I mentioned, for the green transition. Our strategic vision on promoting regional projects on energy must take into consideration this multi-layered new concept of energy security for a more present security, with a more present security dimension. Last but not least, because <laughs> uh, I'm aware about uh, the time management, green transition and climate change. It was mentioned today, but I think it is important to highlight its role. Despite huge investment deficits, inflation uh, and uh, its related uh, limitations, we are also facing huge opportunities, in my view. The EU managed to absorb the main shocks of the world. At the same time, Ukraine became in many cases a showcase example for innovative military and energy solutions. Besides conventional capabilities, it possesses huge potential for future regional green projects, for example. It is the role of our region to have vision and to integrate the need to enhance regional energy security while incorporating the green transition priorities. Here, the role of the bordering states is extremely important in my view. While we show the consistent role with our aid offered to Ukraine, both when delivering energy source, but also spare parts for the industry, I believe there is a great opportunity for our countries to have vision and to integrate the regional green agenda in our energy projects. This is how we can uh, think strategically and include future uh, economic and commercial opportunities. It becomes clear that we would find ourselves in a more advantageous geopolitical position in a future clean energy. This is why I believe that initiatives such uh, is uh, the Austrian uh, one to connect Ukraine, Hungary and Slovakia through a hydrogen project or Croatian initiative to become part of hydrogen valleys or the potential of pipelines to carry hydrogen projects are to be welcomed and replicated so we really move towards beyond fossil fuel based uh, projects and to incorporate new technologies in order to further interconnect the region. 
And I will end by saying, uh, like uh, Minister Beka said, that a democratic Europe can only exist with an educated Romania. I believe that a resilient, uh, prosperous, democratic and sustainable Europe cannot exist with a secure vision and resilient in terms of energy crisis initiative region. Thank you. Thank you and thank you for uh, the effort of uh, putting so much new information in a uh, uh, very limited time. Uh, I'm curious if you see uh, the answer to the energy crisis or the answer to more independence uh, from uh, an energetic point of view within the Dresden communities or outside it. But we'll uh, talk about this uh, later on. Well, um, going to the last uh, expert, last but not least expert, which is Vladimir Vitev, a journalist from uh, Bulgaria, from uh, Cross Border Talks, a dear friend of ours. Please, Vladimir, you have the floor. Thank you, and thank you to the organizers for this invitation. Um, my, uh, my speech will deal with some issues which were already touched by others, especially in the first panel, the polarization issue, and as well as the public sphere, European public sphere. Um, in my view, Bulgaria is suffering a strong uh, polarization right now. Um, and uh, of course, Bulgarian society has been marked by in-group form of social life. Uh, in Western Europe, uh, this uh, type of society usually is called tribal. The issue of tribes is raised. And in uh, the case of the Balkans, usually it's used the, the word mafia, maybe not obligatory in the criminal way, but in the sense that people somehow live through these in-groups and uh, uh, lose their individuality, etc. Uh, however, in these specific conditions of our world, we have a situation in which uh, the American president uh, divides the world into democracies and authoritarian regimes, and we have a situation in which the Russian president attacks Ukraine, and inside the European Union, this contradiction between pro-European Commission and sovereignist forces has been also strong recently. So all this, um, uh, inter all that international context certainly strengthens uh, the polarization and the culture of domination, mutual domination, which exists in Bulgarian society. And in my view, it has some uh, challenges, if not even problems, to democracy. Um, first of all, uh, let me start with this, that um, uh, at the last elections, which took, uh, parliamentary elections, which took place on 2nd April this year, uh, only 40% was the uh, voter turnout. And um, that means that um, the government, which was eventually formed, has the support of maybe 20% of all the voters or even less, because in fact the, the voters of these two parties or groups of par parties uh, supported Originally, they, they voted out of desire to vote against the other partner in the coalition which was formed. Mm -hmm. So that is maybe one first dimension that um, uh, in the conditions of polarization, many people become apathetic and disengaged from politics. They leave it to some very engaged and uh, influential propagandists or uh, fighters in social networks. And uh, that is a potential danger because at certain moment, maybe if international conditions change, what uh, uh, the pro-European or pro-democratic option uh, stands for could be attacked from some mobilization out of these disenchanted people. Secondly, uh, we are in a situation in which our region undergoes modernization and there has been this uh, so-called PNRRA in Romania, a national plan for recovery and resilience, which uh, aims at certain reforms. However, when you have polarized society, uh, any attempt to bring some serious reform, such as green transition, or in the case of Bulgaria, the efforts to uh, move the country closer to the Eurozone, uh, it gets immediately uh, immersed in these uh, polarized contradictions uh, between, let's say, Western Europe or sovereignists, or whatever you call them, pro-European Commission and national allies, or autochthonous allies. So in that situation, um, the energy for change and the ability of the government to promote change in society is limited because you don't work with the whole society and maybe you work with only a part of it. And if too much effort is put into certain reform and resistance is strong, there is a risk of breaking the society. However, for me, the most uh, 
maybe, <laughs> maybe it's my specifics, but I am most interested in the third uh, negative aspect of this polarization is related to the media space. Uh, in the case of Bulgaria, it's very uh, um, obvious that um, our media uh, are unable to form an independent and uh, so-called fourth state uh, form of existence. They're uh, also taken over by this polarization. We have some media who are maybe more professional, uh, but also uh, tend to be funded uh, by uh, foundations such as America for Bulgaria or some oligarchs who are considered on the good side. And we have some other media who are uh, maybe uh, somehow appealing more to populist tendencies or autochthonous tendencies in national capital, etc. And as a result of that, we journalists don't quite have a strong solidarity between one another and uh, we tend to label one another uh, and to reduce ourselves to either grant holders, which means that people are taking their money or salaries from Western foundations, or uh, so-called rubuaji, or people who are promoting, let's say, Eastern interests. And I think that is, um, uh, of course, a negative aspect uh, as um, uh, we are, journalism and media are supposed to be uh, an independent space where, uh, which could be critical of any party. And once again, if we look at the idea of reform and change, there is a need for more media or more journalists or more voices to be able to speak to all the parties of societies and not, not only to uh, one uh, selected group, which is their echo chamber. Uh, so um, um, in the case of Bulgaria, this is also seen in the, in the case of um, professional uh, organizations of journalists with one of them, the Association for Europe of European Journalists, being uh, apparently very well linked to Western uh, media organizations and the other having open, op being open and more appealing to the old generation, more open to countries such as China, Vietnam and Russia. So uh, I, I see here some potential for the Three Seas Initiative and for regional cooperation initiatives to bring change in such a situation of great polarization and I believe it could happen through more um, projects and more support for so-called cross-border media. Uh, I was presented as uh, one of the voices and editors of Cross-Border Talks, which is a media uh, published by uh, a Polish foundation called Napshot Foundation. Uh, but this, in fact, a Polish-Czech-Bulgarian-Romanian cooperation between journalists. And um, uh, I am also in, involved with a second uh, media, which is Bulgarian-Romanian in its essence. It publishes all its materials in Romanian and Bulgarian in English. It's called The Bridge of Friendship. So in both cases, uh, these media allow me as an author and a journalist to somehow stand a little bit outside of our strong polarization and to learn and open to, uh, from, to, open to the region and learn from it. And I think that could be one way to promote a more democratic, tolerant uh, and modern uh, way of thinking in our societies when we are aware of um, what is going on in our region or in our neighboring countries, when we are able to be, be a little bit detached, a little bit uh, looking um, with certain buffer to our national strong passions, maybe we will be able to really, really uh, grow in peace and uh, uh, become uh, more sophisticated in our thinking, which I think is one of the ideas of what some of other speakers discussed about European citizens and European public sphere. So uh, my entry here is that, uh, or my proposal if you wish, uh, is that uh, uh, three C's initiatives could, could, could be think not, could think not only about innovation funds, or investment funds, but maybe it could also discuss internally the idea of some media funds or some possibilities for cooperation between media in the region, which could um, uh, be, however, it's important that, uh, in my view at least, uh, the principle of support for this media should be not uh, the one that is promoting polarization. Uh, so for me, it's very interesting to, to choose, uh, in a way, um, not either or, one side or the other, but to choose both uh, our, well, any, any poles in our societies and be able to change them. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, it is my pleasure and peace to um, have uh, our distinguished guest um, tell us about, not only about their concerns and, and what they regard to be uh, challenges for uh, the platform, uh, but also um, to invite them to tell us a bit about uh, the history of this uh, initiative. And uh, I do that uh, because earlier uh, in the morning, I basically had two flashbacks. Uh, before becoming an academic myself, I was a geopolitical analyst working at Stratfor, and I remember the days before 2014 when we were discussing the Bosnian Termarium, how to connect the two seas back then, uh, the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea, and how can we manage to basically uh, proactively uh, come against a potential uh, aggressive Russia. And then General Jones basically told me about this initiative being, in fact, an initiative to uh, strengthen the cooperation also between the two seas through the so-called Northern Southern Corridor for Europe, which uh, he was part of the signatories and he was part of the initiators. So I will start by asking him to give us a few words about the history with Putin. Um, How do you see it today? Sorry, thank you very much, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's an uh, honor to be with you. Uh, I'm particularly proud to be with uh, my co-chair, um, Georgia Mossbacher, who was a terrific ambassador to Poland in the previous administration, and is, uh, I like to say, it embarrasses her each time, but she's not a person you meet, she's an event you experience, and uh, we will soon see what we mean by that. Um, I retired from uh, active duty in 2007 and um, I became uh, soon thereafter chairman of the uh, Atlantic Council of the United States. And um, uh, it is uh, really an anchor point in my life because it keeps me connected with my European roots. Uh, my family moved to France in 1946. I was educated in Europe and I returned to the United States in 1962 and began a 40-year military career, which was terminated, ironically, in NATO in 2007. Um, another panelist said that said that this is uh, off the record, um, and we have a quote chat and dance rules. It's online. Good. Um, so I'm talking to all my friends. Um, I remember talking to a Washington Post reporter, and. I asked him, what does off the record mean to you? And he says, well, it generally means that we can't quote you unless it's really good. <laughs> so you might want to remember that. I remember that forever. Um, so to get to Antonio's question, uh, it's just, I mean, history is important. And um, the, the work that the Atlantic Council did in 2013 study with our, our really Polish partners. Uh, I remember a gentleman named Pavel Lodnowitz, who was the chairman of the Central Europe Energy Partners Organization and the Central and Eastern Europe Development Institute. And uh, we started with the idea that um, for Europe to be whole uh, and free and prosperous and all the things we want, that Eastern Europe had to be given the opportunity to catch up with Western Europe. And so the initial study uh, was completed on the 21st of November of 2014. And the title of it was um, um, Completing Europe, the North-South Corridor for Energy, Transportation, and um, the Digital um, um, progress. Um, and uh, it, it has blossomed over the years into something that none of us really expected, although we hoped for. Um, it has, 
His inspiration was really the post-World War II Marshall Plan, uh, but one for specifically designed for Eastern Europe. Those of you who lived in Europe at, at this time probably remember that Western Europe was not particularly thrilled with this idea um, because they saw it as a, an attempt by the U.S. government to penetrate the European market with American companies and so on and so forth. Um, over time, that has been overcome, and it's wonderful to see after so many years, over over 10 years, really, um, the support that the Three Seas Initiative and the development of the investment fund uh, have contributed and will con continue to tr uh, make contributions not only um, to European security, but as a global example of what can be done when the private sector and the public sector and the academia uh, think tanks work together for a common goal. So a little bit of history about the, uh, where we are today. Thank you very much. It is a very good introduction, I believe, uh, for uh, my next question uh, to uh, Mr. Montauffler. Um, but so I have to say that I am nervous uh, for two reasons. I have learned about your presence when I was in Poland, when um, back in 2020, um, someone told me, someone in the same tank sent me how uh, probably the most wonderful American ambassador who dedicated her uh, work not only to the bilateral relationship but also to the security uh, and strengthening whatever we are working on as an American political analyst in talking about this connection between the Baltic Sea and the, the Black Sea. So forgive me for being nervous about this today, but um, it is also my pleasure to actually ask you, how do you see uh, we have evolved? And not, not only, I, I will ask you, this is a fireside chat, um, I will ask about your opinion not only as a diplomat, but also as an entrepreneur. Uh, because I, I also am familiar with your work uh, in the business world. So, what do you think? Where have we gotten to uh, since a lot of Well, uh, thank you very much, and it's, it's an honor to be here, and uh, you can imagine what an honor it is for me to co chair with a four star general who was also National Security Advisor, Supreme Commander of NATO. I mean, I could go on, it's pretty intimidating, but um, it's a great honor. Um, this idea of the Three Seas Initiative, I thought uh, its inception uh, was, was important uh, in order to take a look at the region that was behind the Iron Curtain for so long. And then all of a sudden, um, it has to compete with the West. Um, and that takes investment in infrastructure uh, and the kind of things that uh, uh, are not easy and can be done overnight. I think uh, Eastern, Central Eastern Europe has done an amazing job. I know there's a lot of criticism with respect to um, freedom of the press and, and judiciary and all of those kinds of things. Uh, I, I think they're all right, frankly. Uh, I don't know of any election in any of Central Eastern European countries that are worse, wasn't considered free and fair. So uh, having said that, uh, this initiative uh, needed to happen because uh, to have a voice today uh, in just about anything, um, you have small countries, Central Eastern Europe, and you only have three million people or something like that. No one's paying attention. But when you have a region with 100 million people, uh, with an over $2 trillion GDP, that's growing twice as fast as the West, um, you have a voice. And that's what the Three Seas Initiative, I believe, uh, has really given to Central Eastern Europe. Having said that, um, it, it did something quite remarkable in creating the uh, Three Seas Investment Fund to get 12 countries uh, to invest in a fund in itself is remarkable. Uh, we normally committees like that, very, very hard to make work, but this did. 
of the investments that were made been very successful and well, well managed. Um, what didn't happen was uh, the uh, attracting private capital. And that's the challenge now. And I think that the Three Seas Initiative needs to move beyond where it's been. And it has to really uh, set up a office, a secretary, and now go to the next stage of being real with respect to um, being able to attract uh, private capital. Uh, I know saying the second fund and it was talking about a regional investment bank. I think that's a good idea. Um, you have to have a voice in the EU. That's not easy to do when you're a small country, but when you have a hundred million people uh, to uh, be able to get together and have one voice, you're going to be heard. And we can make an impact on the policies, etc. that's happening in the, in the EU. But you have to take the next step of really formalizing um, and putting together a staff I'm not talking about big bureaucracy, I don't think that's necessary, but uh, you need a professional staff uh, to take the three C's initiative and the three C's uh, fund uh, and business to the next stage. But uh, it can be done. It will, it's not easy when you have gone out 13 countries. I think probably the, uh, the first move needs to be uh, 13 countries hiring someone one of the best in the world uh, to be a CEO. Uh, look, uh, CEO of Disney does not go to the board of directors to ask what kind of movie you make. Uh, when, you, when you have 13 voices, it's very difficult to get anything done. I think the next step is for the 13 countries to come together, hire someone that they trust, and move this uh, initiative forward. Uh, so that's in a nutshell, uh, where I see it now and uh, hopefully in the near future. Thank you. So, Bill, the secretary, and it's serious to get private capital in. Um, now, while this is happening, we are no longer just doing this for peace and prosperity in Europe overall, but we are also doing this because we have an actual threat at the border. Uh, we have an ongoing war in Ukraine, and we actually have that threat with Russia, uh, threatening to become more aggressive or engage more aggressive in the hybrid warfare sphere, as we see. <coughs> that said, um, my next question to General Jones would be, what do you believe should be our next step? when it comes to dealing with Russia and rebuilding Ukraine, considering the platform that we have here. And uh, just to give you a summary of what our sessions this morning were about, we were discussing about the role of uh, education and democracy in supporting the Three Seas Initiative. And uh, we also had ideas about uh, you know, coming up with the definition um, if nothing else. Um, and dealing with this as we build prosperity, it's pretty clear that the EU is divisive on this. And you pointed that out. Uh, one of the reasons we have the Three Seas Initiative is because we see the need for us to cooperate in this region. So what what is or what are the next steps with regard to the Ukrainian reconstruction? Thank you.
of the planet when the oil spiller collapses. So the second point we made was that NATO will always be the arch enemy of Russia. And the third point we made was that there had been, a, a, he said, a gentleman's agreement, not a writing, that former Warsaw Pact countries, that NATO would never expand into former Warsaw Pact countries. And he went, he elaborated on that for an hour. Uh, we stayed another hour so, so that my question could actually make a response. But um, after the meeting on the way out to the car, President Obama turned to me and said, you know, pocket word in the face of pretext uh, with Russia. And the President said, this is likely to be a short pretext. And it turned out to be perfectly true. Um, there will be shortly a uh, study that will be released uh, maybe even this week, um, done by the Atlantic Council on the Black Sea, on the Black sea Strategy. And it addresses the, the, the question that you raised. And um, it talks about what, what now. I mean, I think one thing that we have to all agree on, I think we even hold hands when we do it, is to say that the defense of Europe is a real issue. It's unfortunate. We don't like to talk about it. But the borders for, for European security are no longer Germany. They are the Black Sea countries and the Baltic states. And you can draw the North South line pretty clearly as to what that entails. The um, inadvertently, I'm sure, that Mr. Putin miscalculated. Um, dramatically miscalculated the resilience of the West and the capacity that the West has to thwart most Russian ambitions in the region. That's not going to prevent them from trying uh, in all manner and shapes of things. But uh, if I were him, I would be sleeping at night with my eyes open because I know that he never visualized that two more, two more countries would come to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Never in his wildest dreams. Never in his wildest dreams did he think about the resilience of the Ukrainian people and the capacity and the quality of the Ukrainian armed forces, which had been astonishing to many people. But for those of us in the trade knew that the Ukrainians had years ago adopted the more Western style of warfare, which the Russians rejected. And the capacity and the capability between the two, particularly the first year when Ukraine was on the defensive uh, and Russia was on the offensive, were really uh, on clear display. This year, Ukraine is on the offense and Russia is more on the defense. And in military terms, that takes much more manpower to be uh, about three times what manpower to play offense as opposed to defense. So, uh, what can we do? Um, I think we have to be clear eyed and tackle the overall strategic issue that on the globe, let alone the region, on the globe, we have a, a battle between autocracies and democracies. And, and it's very, very important for your children, your grandchildren, my children, grandchildren, maybe even great-grandchildren by the time I'm here. Um, it's very important that we win this. And how we do that is not by military might alone. It's by a coordinated, um, effective, rapid, flexible, series of international policy that shows nations that on different continents that are vacillating between autocracies and democracy that the best way by far is, is to be a successful democracy. In the case of the region, in the case of the Black Sea region, I would say that um, expanded exception to the three seas by countries who would like to become members should that should be expanded and it should be accelerated. So there's a clear line um, that separates uh, Russia and and its observers, and I mean by that I mean China, I mean Iran, I mean North Korea and other countries on different continents that are having this tug of war between which they want to go. And one of the ways we do this uh, is by 
lifting the sanctions on Russia, convincing China that it's backing the wrong war, making sure that the president of China sees the consequences that will follow to Vladimir Putin as a result of his barbaric efforts uh, in Ukraine. He is, by the ICC standards, a war criminal, and he should always be a war criminal. And it will be very important, regardless of how this conflict ends, to make sure that, that the world sees Vladimir Putin for who, what he is. That there's, not, there's no forgiveness here. There's no, oh, well, let's let bygones be bygones. This is a moral issue of the highest um, qualities, a value issue of the highest democratic um, principles, and that should not be forgiven. Um, Secondly, the military proficient, I think, is important. Um, we can all be very proud of how NATO has reacted, I think. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the defense of Europe does not start with Germany. Um, it starts right here. And um, it's important that, that Russia sees that a, a formidable obstacle to going any further than it has already done. And in order to do that, you have to do a lot of things that the European countries have already done. That's increase their percentage of GDP for pure military capabilities, relocate forces uh, closer to the line where the defense of Europe starts, and present a uh, formidable obstacle to any more of, of Vladimir Putin's expansionist uh, ideas. Sanctions that we have not used um, can be applied, and I would strongly recommend that that be considered. Um, and lastly, I would just say that appeasement is not the strategy here. We, to, we don't want World War III, but we tried appeasement with Russia, we tried appeasement with China and other countries, and Iran in particular. That doesn't work for autocracy. And so I would counsel that, that you don't want to start a world war, but autocracies understand the demonstrated use of power, whether it's economic or military or social or cultural, uh, financial, all of these things harnessed towards a given end can produce results that um, would preclude, I think, world war. The war or an expansion into a nuclear conflict. Um, and we'll just have to wait and see and do the best we can. But I, uh, I hope I've answered your question. Do you have anything uh, more food for thought than, uh, than I thought uh, about, actually? So thank you for answering that question. I know it, it actually may have a more extensive answer. And um, therefore, I will ask the, the first question that comes to after listening to, to what you said. And then I'll ask Ambassador, uh, what do you think, because I, the Three Seas Initiative was not about Russia, per se. It was about building that defensive line. It was about building cohesive uh, economic prosperity in the region so that we can stand uh, by and we can build a better future for us, primarily. But it was also about building the better future with regards to democracy versus autocracy and keeping the influence of China down in this region. So with that in mind, considering that you mentioned the Black Sea strategy and uh, the Black Sea strategy document, uh, on my knowledge, also mentions uh, China as a threat in the Black Sea, considering that now the, the land corridors from Asia into Europe is pretty much blocked due to the conflict in, uh, in Ukraine. And obviously, trade is being done uh, through the Black Sea, and China is shipping through the Black Sea uh, and is increasing its presence in this region. What do you think could be maybe some other measures that we could take in building resilience? Considering the geoeconomic economic roundabout that I call, uh, we 
entered in 2022 when Russia started the war, when we imposed sanctions, and so on. So what are your thoughts on this? Well, certainly uh, strengthening your economic well-being uh, and investing in your security in your military, as well as cyber. Uh, I do believe that Central Eastern Europe, where we where we're sitting right now, is the gateway for China into into the West. And uh, so I do think the three C's. Uh, one of its 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 jobs is to uh, take a look at. Uh, the security uh, it is the eastern flank of NATO. Uh, I do think that has to be part of the three C's mandate, is to work together for uh, interoperability. Uh, and that covers everything from infrastructure, uh, rail, roads, ports, and uh, cyber, because um, to have a, a, a strong military, you have to have that interoperability. Uh, 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 so I do think that, that that's an important role for the three C's initiative. Um, so I think it, it does go on beyond beyond just it, the infrastructure is fundamental to security. You can't move an army if you don't have the uh, infrastructure to do so. So I think it's fundamental to that. And of course, it's fundamental to prosperity. Uh, countries that are prosperous are not normally aren't threatening. Um, and you have those Russia and China right, right, right here. I, I'd like to maybe take it just a, a step further and say that um, I do think uh, we do have to have some introspection here and ask ourselves, how did we get here? It's the 21st century uh, to watch bombs drop on cities. It's kind, of, kind of, with all this technology and what we've, and the, the middle class that we've been able to create in the world, how did this happen? What was the, what is, what were those failures of the great democracies that watched 200,000 troops on the border of Ukraine and tell us what he was going to do, and yet we couldn't stop it. What well, I, I think we have to just really examine that so it doesn't happen again. Because I do believe this, that this wasn't a surprise, and so we have to ask ourselves, was it a surprise? That what should we have done, what could we have done, and what should we be doing so it doesn't happen again? And then the next question I think we have to ask ourselves, and particularly in this region, since you know, Russia is your neighbor, is when Ukraine wins, then what? Uh, Russia isn't Cuba, it, it, it isn't Venezuela. I mean, it's, it's a big country. and. Um, We've been pushing it. This is pushing it toward our enemies, North Korea, Iran, China. And so how, how do we make it pay a price, but at the same time figure out how we bring it back into the family? So that um, Russia is no longer a threat. Um, and I'm not sure, and I, I, I would like to see Three C's. Uh, ask that question. Is, it, is your neighbor? And after all, we have an ocean between us, and um, so it'll impact you directly. How uh, Russia is seen after it loses. So uh, I do think there is a role for certainly the leadership in three C's. To be, to be sitting down and really having this discussion uh, as to what's, what does that look like, what does winning look like, and what 
does Russia look like when it loses and how you deal with that and how you want to rebuild a relationship that's positive so it isn't a threat any longer. I think these are excellent questions to ask academics about. Uh, because we have the power, I believe, to go to politicians and to business leaders and pretty much ask those questions and do research on that. Uh, but yes, as to the future questions, I have no way to get to those, but through analysis. And before we end this fire senate chat, of which I thank you already, um, I would like to ask you a very short question, maybe a short answer as well, I don't know. Because we have talked about threats, have talked about weaknesses in a way. And we have talked about strengths. What are the opportunities that we see moving the path? This is also because I'm an optimist, and I'd like to end on an optimistic note here. Um, considering everything that's going on, I believe the academia should be optimistic because otherwise we don't have the power to get to ask around. So what are the opportunities that you see for the region and for Europe? For both of you. So I, I didn't mention uh, in my previous answer education, but it's, it's critical. Uh, it's critical not, not just in this, in, this, uh, in, in this region, it's critical all over the world. And it's critical in the United States. If you look at the um, if you look at the polls in the U.S. about the our involvement uh, in Ukraine, then you would probably be a little bit alarmed. Um, and, and part of the reason for that is because of our educational process is undergoing a tremendous uh, shockwave of uh, purpose and. Um, it's very important that, um, that, that our education is honest uh, in terms of history, and it, it has its rightful place in the education of our young people who will succeed us at the table like these in the future. Without education and without history, you have not, you are just living for the moment, and you can't be served. So I, I say education across the board is, is very important. Um, I, I also think that um, on the optimistic side of things, that if the three C's concept takes root, it will have global consequences. And then that's not an optimistic. It will have consequences in Africa. It will have consequences in our own hemisphere, in South America and other continents. For providing a, a guiding light, if you will, for, for a vision for a better life. If you want to cut down on the illegal immigration from the African continent to the European continent, what better way is there than to have presented a model that works and they can end right? So that would be my optimistic uh, projection. And I think it's quite possible that we could have that, that kind of impact. Um, I, I, I do think we, we have to face certain realities with social media and AI and misinformation and uh, hybrid warfare, etc. Uh, we need to better educate, back to what the journal said, uh, we need to educate um, the next generation on being able to question what they read and hear and see and how to deal with uh, social media and uh, the internet. And uh, these, uh, these are not new brainwashing techniques, um, but it's just more pervasive. And I think we have to face that. And then the, this whole woke uh, uh, dialogue and, and if, if you can't discuss the problem, how do we fix it? And to accept the fact 
fact that um, we can have different opinions, but if we don't allow someone to state that other opinion, even if we really don't agree with it, uh, we talk about free press, but when they shut you down at universities, they don't allow speakers because um, they don't like the message. Um, we've seen a lot of that in the United States. That's very terrifying, personally, I think. Uh, no matter how repugnant that message may be, um, better that it be heard and we can debate it than to shut it down by calling someone a name or racist or whatever word you want to use to silence them. And I think we're using those words to do that. Um, and I think that's dangerous. So uh, I, I do think we have a whole new, a new set of challenges with communication, being what they are. And uh, look, uh, I can remember when there wasn't a cell phone. Yeah, I'm that old. I can't manage. I, it's hard for me to even imagine what did they do without a cell phone. You know, how did my mother keep track of where we were? I mean, there were four of us. And she, you know, she said, yeah, be home by 11 o'clock. I think, you know, if we weren't home at 11, then how did she find us? Right? But the truth is, uh, uh, we love my mother as much as we fear. That's why we were home at 11. She didn't need a cell telephone. Um, but I think these are genuine challenges. I, I, I don't mean to make light of them, but uh, we are living in a, in a new world where all of this pick up my telephone and, and these algorithms are telling me what I want to hear and what I want to see based on what I've already read, where I've already been. And I think that's dangerous. So um, I know that's not optimistic. But. Just one more point. Um, there's a think tank in the US called Freedom House. And uh, using Freedom House and the global freedom scores, Three seats region averages um, on the score of 0 to 100. Three seats region averages a score of 86, which is quite good. The EU scores 90.5. The United States scores 83. And Russia scores 16. And that's it. That's a good way to. And uh, on an optimistic note, not really. Uh, but considering that, um, I'm telling you what I would have done with no cell phones today. I probably continue to question with questions and uh, debates because, uh, you know, I have a lot of and I'm very curious about your answers. Uh, and I'm also hoping that you forgive my nervousness today. Uh, and with that, I have to end the panel because I was told on a message on the mobile phone. Because, yeah, I mean, um, schedules do matter. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you for being with us and for sharing uh, your thoughts with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to everyone for accepting to organize this session. It was the final session conceived uh, on this event, but uh, we underlined, as I mentioned in the beginning, how can we speak about development, about prosperity, without this kind of discussion, about the healthy of our society. And uh, yes, like uh, Antonia, I wanted to end concluding an optimistic <laughs> uh, way, but uh, I think the most optimistic aspect is the fact that we are discussing, we are interacting, uh, sharing our ideas. This is the place uh, where we can do this is university. And related to the tension between academics, which uh, many times, including myself, go publicly saying different, not so nicely, ideas about the public policies and sometimes even about politicians. <laughs>
I think we have to keep uh, doing this in the future because I, I'm not saying we are all the time right, but uh, at least we provoke, we catalyze discussions, uh, a second thought on a specific uh, public policy or governmental decision, and uh, together with uh, journalists, together with NGOs, together with specialized institutions of government. consider the capacity of our governments to, to produce uh, good uh, public policies, we have to look in an optimistic way forward. Once again, thank you very much. And uh, before to conclude, I would like two other short things to mention. We had today very quiet Juliana Popescu, university professor in our university, former uh, vice director in our university and today she is the director, I think we can say rector of the Romanian Diplomatic Institute. She will attend the uh, session this night uh, on a discussion on the Black Sea. And uh, the very final, final idea, uh, you know, we need also to record for the history this moment. We recorded the faith, but picture together outside would be also very good. Thank you very much for your participation.